If you had eyes that could see dark matter, you would see this ghost-like wind rushing through you. There'd be a constant wind, and it's coming from the direction that our sun is traveling through the galaxy in the constellation Cygnus. It would just be a constant stream of rushing particles. For some reason, I always picture it as blue. I don't know why. So these particles constantly rushing through you at 250 kilometers per second. We're so used to thinking of it as out there, somewhere, holding the stars in their orbit around the Milky Way, or doing other fantastical astronomical things. But it's right here, in this room. There is a gale of it blowing through us right now. It is a companion to our lives that we have never felt, tasted, touched, seen. And yet its gravity was responsible for us being here. Wouldn't you want to meet that companion who's been in your life, your whole life, and indeed for the entire length of the universe itself? That is the reason that your galaxy is even here. I think it's by time we met this dark matter. A working gold mine is a dirty, dangerous place. And possibly the last place you'd expect to find a physics lab trying to solve one of the greatest mysteries of the universe from a kilometre underground. Copy shift boss. Copy Jeremy. We're on our way to what will be the SUPL, the Stall Underground Physics Laboratory. And to get there, we're driving through a very busy mining operation. Now the idea is that all this rock we're driving under will block out cosmic interference and stop it from reaching down into the lab that sits at the end of this tunnel. And in that lab is going to sit a remarkable device waiting to detect a particle of dark matter. A particle no one has ever seen. It's like a ghost, able to travel through solid walls, through us, through, well, the entire Earth and never collide. So that's tricky when you want to try and find it. It makes up more than 80% of all the matter in our universe. It's believed to be a product of the Big Bang, a mass of particles that formed an invisible three-dimensional web in space with so much gravity that our visible universe clings to it, strung along its strands. We're pretty sure it's there because we can observe light bending around objects in space that we can't see. The search for dark matter has been going on for a hundred years. The Swiss astronomer Fritz Vicky first noticed that galaxies in the Coma Cluster were moving incredibly fast. So fast that they should have gone spinning off into the universe. But they didn't. Instead, some massive unseen gravitational force was filling up the cluster and holding them in place. Fritz Vicky called it a dark matter. Forty years later, the American astronomer Vera Rubin noticed that our closest galaxy, Andromeda, was spinning just as fast on its outer edge as it was in the middle, another impossible phenomenon. And it was the same for every other galaxy she looked at. She posited that there was some invisible halo of matter surrounding them and accelerating their rate of spin. She calculated that this unseen material must outweigh all the visible material five times over. But can it be found underground? What gives us hope that we're looking in the right location is because one experiment did claim a detection. This is the Dama Libra experiment. Based in Italy, it has for years tracked the dark matter signal in its detectors. So we want to rule in or rule out that detection. The Dharma Libra Lab's detection shows the same pattern every year. Detections go up and down with the seasons, peaking in June and dropping to their lowest in November. This project is going to recreate that experiment on the other side of the world. And that's important. For half the year, our Earth is in the same direction 
around the sun as the sun is traveling. And for half a year, we're going the opposite direction. What that means is, for half of the year, when we're both going in the similar direction, the headwind picks up speed. We'll see more dark matter particles rushing towards us, our detector will glow more frequently. And then for the next half of the year, we'll be going in the opposite direction. The wind drops in intensity, we'll see fewer particles. In other words, by placing a detector that's similar to theirs at the very other side of the Earth, we can tell whether that is the seasons or dark matter. It's just the simplest possible test one could do, and that's what makes it so powerful. There's no interpretation needed, it's, it's right there. Did you see more in June than December? Then it could be dark matter. So we're about 15 minutes into the trip, having left what up there is a very cold Western Victorian morning. But here the windows are fogging up and when we get down to the end, it's going to be about 28 degrees and around 90% humidity. The trip down is about eight or nine kilometres. It takes around half an hour and it's pretty rough going. It's bumpy and it's windy and you're dodging very, very large mining vehicles. And this is the only way that this project can happen because it's in a working mine. There's no way that the university could afford infrastructure like this. The power, the lights, the transport, the safety, the ventilation, everything to make this lab work. Today, the heads of the National ARC Centre of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics are checking on the progress of construction. Getting out of these utes, the humidity is like getting off a plane in Bali, but instead of board shorts, we're wearing safety gear. It's amazing, we've only just got out of the vehicles and gone to get our camera equipment and look at the condensation on that. And this is air conditioned, remarkable. How's it look? It looks fantastic, it's really impressive as it come along in the last year. This is where the lab buildings will sit, constantly monitoring the massive device that will attempt to detect a particle of dark matter. The first step is making this lab as cosmically sterile as possible. How hard is that to, to shut out everything that the universe is trying to punch into it? It's not easy. So first of all, you need to go underground and we are one kilometers underground. So the radioactivity come from the star, mainly from the sun, does not penetrate over here. Then you need to shut down all the radioactivity come from all the rocks and the floor around, so we needed to test every single component of from the cement to the concrete to the sand, everything that we put in to be sure that is very low radioactivity. Even the rocks that shut out the radio waves are themselves a problem. They have to be coated with a special material to stop them from emitting radon gas. The reason is that when you touch the rock here, it's, it's quite warm Ooh, yeah, it and is. is emitting a lot so of uh, That's heat. where the heat's coming from? Yes, because it's the radioactivity in the rock. If we are on the surface, obviously it's becoming cold because there is air and so on. Here there is not much circulation. Yeah. Uh, it would be wonderful if you did find it. Absolutely, we will know what the universe is made of. This is a big project for a smallish gold fields town. Even one like Stahl, which already has a pretty big claim to fame. This is Central Park and for more than a hundred years this has been the home of the Stall Gift, Australia's richest professional foot race. The tension is on and the bookmakers and public alike are divided on the question of favouritism between Beauty and Carson. Runners come from all over to try to write their names into the record books on this oval. And it's a similar thing with this Dark Matter project. The components come from all over waiting to be assembled into this device, this vessel, that will try to catch a glimpse of dark matter. Now it's not here, it's going to be the last thing to arrive. Right now, it's waiting to be assembled in Juan Turner at the Swinburne Uni Trade School. It's a pretty phenomenal place. It's exactly what you need. These kinds of tools are going to help us do that final fit out. Here it is. So how big is it? So this is three metres in height. The entire vessel is about uh, two tonnes of stainless steel. But it's what's inside that's really mind-blowing. At its heart will be seven seven-kilogram crystals of pure sodium iodide, a level of purity pioneered by Princeton University. And they are what gives the project its name, 
the sodium iodide with active background rejection experiment, or SABRE. It's an insane project where the, the purity of this crystal, we know the atoms within that crystal to one part in trillions. In other words, count a trillion atoms of sodium and iodine in this crystal and you might find one other kind of atom lurking around in there. It is an absurdly precise, constructed, grown crystal and that's the kind of lengths you have to go to to find a ghost. This project is betting that the ghost will turn out to be a weakly interacting massive particle, or a WIMP for short. There's a lot of good reasons for why the WIMP might be the dark matter particle. It's produced in the right amounts early in the universe. Our theories suggest it should still be hanging around today. There's lots of good reasons to think it might be there. But nature doesn't have to be kind. If a WIMP hits a nucleus in a crystal, it should create a tiny flash. That flash is then detected by ultra-sensitive cameras known as photomultiplier tubes at either end of each crystal. But being sure it's dark matter that's flashing means blocking out every other particle known to physics. And that's where the active background rejection part comes in. It's a veto system inside the vessel to rule out any false positives. And it's a liquid called linear alkyl benzene. It's specially made in Japan and it's waiting here in a very large tank in a car park at the Melbourne Synchrotron. Hey Phil, okay. how are you? Well, so this is this big tub of dangerous liquid you had to get into the country somehow. The liquid scintillator system has two jobs. One of them is to measure the, or to detect the natural radioactivity that we have in our crystals. In addition to that, we're looking to suppress background that can come from natural radioactivity in the Stahl Underground Physics Lab. Low energy neutrons can come in from the outside and they look like dark matter. So by having this veto system in the way, that veto system can either absorb those neutrons and stop them in their tracks, or those neutrons can induce uh, light again. Uh, and we'll, we'll be able to see that. But if the crystal gets struck, you look around, did anything else flash? If so, then that must have been a cosmic ray, that must have been radiation. Dark matter is the only thing that could slip through the liquid and still hit the crystal. Something we don't know is whether or not this is like one particle. We're just looking for something like a neutrino and uh, we'll, we'll find it and then the story's over. Or it could be like a, a hidden universe, a, uh, a dark version, a hidden version of all of the, the, uh, the, the matter particles that we see in our, in our day to day lives. Are you talking like different dimensions or something like that? You, you might say that. Um, we, th there are some other theories uh, that involve having a dark version of a photon or a dark version of the Higgs boson. Some theory even think that there is a kind of universe that does not interact with us, a phantom universe that is as complex as ours, but we cannot see because it's made of dark matter. We just don't know what it's made of. It could be a particle as heavy as as a protein or almost a virus. It could be something as light as the hydrogen atom or even lighter. In fact, it could be trillions of times lighter. This area we have to search is frankly alarming and terrifying and thrilling, but you gotta start somewhere. Well, it's been a while, but we're back in stall on another cold Western Victorian morning because we've been told that the work on building the lab is complete. So we'll go and take a look. Well, it's a year later and I'll be pretty interested to see what's different. First thing you notice is uh, this was all completely open before. Now there's a great big wall there and some heavy doors. Let's go take a look. Well, the first thing you notice is it's a lot cleaner than it was. It's a lot quieter than the rest of the mine. Just the sound of that air conditioning, and it's a lot cooler. Elizabeth is back too, and as excited as ever. And when do you think you'll actually be able to throw the switch and turn this thing on? We hope in a year from now. It takes a long time. 
Yes, you know, we need to bring down 200 tons of steel. But it's very exciting because then the experiment, once it's running, it will take about two years to confirm or refute the, the Italian experiment. So once we are done, we'll quick relatively to the experiment. But this kind of experiment takes a long time in the planning and the building. Normally our 10-year project, five to six years in the making and four to five years in taking data. Nothing happens quickly in space. No. Nah. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Now, of course, all this could find absolutely nothing at all, which wouldn't be a failure because, as the Mythbusters said, failure is always an option. It would just mean that scientists need to rethink their model. The world needs to know whether they are right or wrong. If they're right, Nobel Prize is for them. Wonderful. If they're wrong, then we should look somewhere else. Either way, we rule it in or out, it's a spectacular scientific result. Well, there it is, in there, down the bottom of this mine shaft, the room where we might unlock some of the mysteries of the universe or create many, many more questions.